Hello and welcome to the Journeys with PDA Coffee Chat podcast, where we seek community connection and co-regulation while chatting about all things PDA. Hello and welcome to Journeys with PDA Coffee Chat podcast. I'm Heather. And I'm Carissa. Today, we're so excited to have a special guest with us today. Uh, We have Donna Henderson, and she is author of the book, Is This Autism? Uh, Thank you, Donna, for being with us today. Um, Go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, thank you for having me. I guess I'll start by clarifying I'm a co-author of the book. I have two amazing co-authors, Dr. Sarah Whalen and Dr. Jamel White. And um, I'm a licensed psychologist and clinical neuropsychologist. I did not get much training in autism and um, avoided it for a lot of my career and eventually realized, wait a minute, this is pretty important stuff and I need to figure it out. And then I realized it wasn't just me. It was kind of the whole mental health field needed, had a lot to learn about autism. And that's, you know, very briefly my professional journey. Personally, I'm not autistic myself. I am an adhd and I have um, two of my three kids are autistic. Awesome. Um, well, so you're also pretty familiar with PDA, is that correct? It is, yeah. I learned about, I had never heard of PDA until one day, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. It's hard to remember. Um, I was working with a little boy, the cutest. I mean, I can still picture him so clearly. Everything about him was adorable. And he was so engaging with me and delightful until I asked him to do something. And then he basically threw stuff at me and, you know, told me that that wasn't happening. And he had come to see me for a neuropsych eval because he had just massive behavioral problems at school, just hitting teachers and throwing things and knocking over desks and, you know, eloping from the school grounds. And somebody else had diagnosed him with oppositional defiant disorder, which to me, does nothing to help you understand a child's nervous system or what they need or how to parent them or how to teach them. So I was stumped trying to figure out what is going on with this kid. And um, in my research, I came across PDA and it fit him so completely. And I found it fascinating. And that sort of sent me down a rabbit hole. And now I see lots of PDAers. It was, it. it was so exciting. I'm exciting in a sense of, hey, you know, I feel seen when when I picked up your book and actually saw that you have dedicated there is it, PDA is referenced in your book. Um, and it was just kind of a, a breath of fresh air to actually see it referenced in in a, you know, in a book that is very easy to read, even if you're not a clinician. Um, but it was just having that recognition was just very, it was very nice to see as a mom of a PDA and also as somebody that helps, um, you know, our, through our organization helps families with, with PDA themselves. Um, I, I just say that makes me so happy because I okay. think that parents of PDA that aren't seen, they are, are traumatized aren't seen, are invalidated, are blamed, are shamed. I just, my heart goes out to parents of PDAers really, really deeply. So. Well, I'm, I'm glad it, I'm glad it makes you happy because it, 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 it kind of like, there's a glimmer of hope. You know, the more we see this in the literature, it's like, okay, there's just it more sunshine that gets put on the subject the better it is for everybody else. And I truly believe, I mean, in my heart and in my gut, believe that the more people who understand this, recognize it, and who can diagnose this, it's going to save lives. And whether it means people are, they're recognizing and they can support that their nervous systems correctly, if school systems can understand this and can accommodate correctly, then, you know, I just think it can only do 
so much good in the world for this because it is such a misunderstood um, profile. It's yep. just a misunder, yeah. Yep. Um, so along with, in the vein of pathological demand avoidance, many, many of our families, many, many of our PDAers either have a atypical presentation of autism or they can't even get diagnosed. They can't get through an evaluation. They can't, they can't, they can't because they make eye contact and they're social. And a lot of times those are the two disqualifiers of why they cannot access a, um, an evaluation for, to be diagnosed. And that is really the root, that is the core of your book is atypical autism in the presentation. Can you, do you mind kind of walking us through the beginning, like the conception of this for you? And then like the realization and like, hey, this, we really need to get this message out and we need to get this information to more people's hands. Yes. Gosh, I have so many thoughts. So first of all, like I said, I at first thought it was just me. Like, gosh, Donna, you didn't learn much about autism. I, I, had, I had almost no training in it in graduate school. And, and I avoided it. And it, that was normalized by my colleagues and my supervisors because so many of them were like, oh, I don't do autism. They can go to a, a, like a hospital-based autism clinic. And so when I started learning about it, I was sort of secretly embarrassed and ashamed that I had this big um, um, blank when it came to autism. I knew so much about ADHD and learning disorders and other types of, you know, different, having a different kind of brain and, and not autism. And after a while, I started realizing, holy cow, this is so widespread among clinicians and educators. So I started teaching people in my close professional circle, my colleagues, and you know, if a therapist would send me referrals, I'd end up teaching that therapist or that psychiatrist. And then it just grew and grew and grew. And now I spend just much of my time doing workshops for groups of professionals, trying to teach them about autism. And the response is, has been amazingly positive. It's so exciting to see clinicians light up. This happens 100% of the time. They go, oh my God, I have autistic clients on my caseload right now. Yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. you, just didn't, yeah. you didn't know they were <laughs> autistic, but it's, and like to see like all the dots are connecting and to see people not just say, oh yeah, I need to understand autism, but to love it and to lean into it and to realize how life-changing it is yes. for their clients and their students and their children. It's just so much fun. It's just the most satisfying work I've, I've ever done is, is teaching all these clinicians. So um, eventually I started writing all of this stuff down thinking, oh, I'm gonna write a book and now I'm pretty ADHD. So it would be very much like me to be like, I'm just gonna write a book and not do it. Um, that's where my, my co-author Sarah Wayland came in and um, she, she ma made me write the book and wrote it with me and um, definitely wouldn't have done it without her. And so the core of it is explaining the seven main diagnostic criteria for autism. And for each of these criteria, what people think it means but what it really means, what it encompasses, how it can manifest in people, not with atypical autism, I wouldn't call it atypical, but with a less obvious presentation of autism. I appreciate right? that so, clarification, yeah. thank you. Yeah, and I also wanna say, I agree with, you made a comment that eye contact and being social are like have disqualified people. And just to be really clear, those things shouldn't disqualify oh, people absolutely. from a yeah, diagnosis right. of autism. It, those are inappropriate disqualified. Mm -hmm. There are lots of autistic people are um, friendly, are extroverted, are engaged and engaging, right? That's not necessarily atypical for autism. And lots of autistic people make typical eye contact 
Um, but find it effortful or distracting or mm -hmm. unpleasant or whatever. You've got to get at that inner experience there. So anyway, so we wrote this book, um, the, um, it's the, the diagnostic criteria. And then we have chapters on all the things that come along with autism, all the co-occurring challenges. And that's where we put in PDA. Um, and then of course, autistic strains, because those are equally as important. And um, we thought we were writing the book for clinicians. We went with an academic publisher because we thought this book is only for clinicians. And as we wrote it, there was so much interest from parents and educators and autistic people themselves and people who thought they were autistic. And that's why we titled it um, a, a book for clinicians and everyone else. I, I spend time um, in autistic spaces for specifically like for women, just so I can kind of, you know, online spaces in different forums, just so I can see what is, you know, where the tides are going, where, you know, where our focus is. Um, plus I, you know, I shared before we started recording, um, I'm ADHD, but I also suspect I'm autistic as well. And I can't tell you how many times I have subliminally put your book, this book in these spaces specifically for people who are struggling and they can't get anyone else to recognize it or believe them because they don't present like the classic, right. what we, you know, um, so Thank you there. And it is, you know, it is l life changing when you get the diagnosis that you've, you've, you know, suspected yeah. and then you can finally go, Oh, that's, Oh, you know, it's, it's, I've seen, I've seen these patterns of like relief, but then there's mourning. Yeah. And it's just because of that recognition of like, oh, well, you know, it shouldn't have been that hard. <laughs> like, right. you know, and like, to be clear, like the morning isn't I'm sad I'm autistic. Or I'm no, sad my child is I'm that, sad that it wasn't recognized. It wasn't recognized. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Yes. Because I, yes. And you, yes. Yeah. So I'm it with is, you there. Yeah. So, so many important. clinicians have like fear. I'm sorry. I'm interrupting. <laughs> no. Hey, are we not ADHD? This is know, what we right? do, right? It's like. I'm like um, leaning into this whole neurodivergent <clears throat> space. So um, no, please. So yeah, I, I constantly have to tell clinicians to face their own fears mm -hmm. about bringing up the possibility of autism or diagnosing it and face like their own feelings about autism because, um, it, it's not fair to clients. And most of the time, the overwhelming majority of the time, when I say to somebody, you're autistic, it is, it's relief. There's lots yes. of other feelings too, yes. but there's so much relief there. Yes. So much validation, right? They yes. can finally start to have language to understand them. Yes. Yes. So I have, I have two children. Um, so I have a daughter and a son and, and, and it was like, we could, we just didn't know what was going on, but we knew that they were both different and they were both different in completely opposite ways. And, and so, um, it took so, so much like digging and time. And I would make lists of things like, you know, that was going on with my son about, um, you know, saying like, I, I think that there's really something more here. And because we're not recognizing like how his brain works, we're also not providing him with the right supports. And so as we sort of like dug and I had to push a little bit and, you know, really bring up a lot of points and keep saying, is this autism? Is this autism? And, and so, um, one of the things was, but, but he will look at you and, you know, he'll, he'll look at, he'll look at everyone. And I just was like, I just don't feel like that one piece sort of voids out everything else that's going on. And, um, so, 
so after quite a bit of time, it actually was a, um, a year of like constant um, different therapies that we could sort of like peel away the layers and go, okay, so I actually have a little boy who's autistic, um, but he doesn't look like what everyone here expected an autistic boy to look like. And so that was pretty big to have a, a boy who wasn't following sort of what we think, you know, being autistic is. Um, and, and so then I was like, okay, I got the hang of it. I know, like, I know what autism looks like. I, I like, I know what the characteristics are. I like, I get it. And, um, then my daughter and I had, um, a clinical psychologist go, Hey, uh, your daughter's autistic. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> Cause like my, like my son's autistic. So I'm like kind of up on how this works. And she's like, Nope, she's autistic. Um, also, Hey, there's this thing called pathological demand avoidance. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you need to look into that. And so it was so mind blowing to have two autistic kids and, and just be like, so different, but yet like that overall being so much the same. And, and so when you talk about you know, these different presentations are atypical, um, that, that has such a huge impact on my personal life. Um, and if some, it, you know, if the people weren't willing to sort of like open up their mind and their perspective a little, like we would be struggling so, so much. And now, now that both of the kids are doing their, you know, their own things, but but now they're flourishing. And so you bringing all this like kind of out in the open is so important. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I'm finding myself feeling grateful for your kids that they have a mom who is just researching this and not giving up and trying to understand her kids. And, and I agree with your main point. I mean, there is no typical autism. It can look, a, account literally countless different ways every autistic person is unique they are as varied as non-autistic people are so if anybody has a stereotypical idea of autistic people they need to get that out of their heads right now like you know they can't be athletic wrong you know they can't be social wrong they don't have friends wrong they don't want friends wrong they have behavioral problems wrong they don't make eye contact wrong they don't have a sense of humor wrong like we could go on all day like this right Right. Yes. None of those things are true. Nope. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that's why it's sort of my mission to help people understand the, the diagnostic criteria and what, how they really manifest. Uh, right. Instead of just, uh, you know, it's, I kind of feel like there's a lot of people who look at that as just like little check boxes, right? Like, yep, yep, yep. But not that like digging into like, what does it look like for a 10 year old girl to have difficulties in social communication? Like, what does it look like in a, in a 10 year old girl? Um, realistically. Yes. yes. And Carissa more, more to the point, what does it feel like for that 10 year old girl? And uh, that's yes. one of the things I really encourage clinicians to think about is not just what it looks like on the outside, because some of these kiddos can really pull off socially typical for periods of time, but what does it feel like? And, and I divide it into before, during, and after interactions. So what does it feel like before interactions? Are you planning? Are you coming up with bullet points and specific questions of what to talk about? Are you gathering your energy? Like all of that sort of thing. During, are you consciously thinking about how much eye contact you're making? Are you consciously planning your gestures? Are you trying to figure out when it's your turn to talk? Like all of that sort of stuff that happens in the moment. And then after interactions, are you exhausted? 
Did you just have a 10 minute interaction and now you need to go to bed for the rest of the day? So that before, during and after understanding the internal experience, not just what it looks like externally, I think is just a huge piece that everybody needs to think about. Oh, so that is like right there. Like that's it. And I, as you say that, like, I am thinking about my daughter because, um, she is very, very social. And, and so then by thinking about that before, during, and after, when you really, really concentrate on those pieces, you know, I can see and, and empathize with her how really, really hard all of that is. And, um, if I had known to be looking for that, I, I probably would have realized um, before she was 10 years old that she was autistic. Um, obviously, Maybe, I, but let me throw in one more piece there. We have been taught to think of autism as something that will show itself by about age two or three. Mm -hmm. But with a lot of bright autistic kids, particularly girls, but people all across the gender spectrum. Um, but the research is on the girls where we really start to notice, hey, something's going on here is around age 10. It's around fifth grade. That is very, very typical for bright autistic girls. Oh, wow. I, I see. I've never heard that. That is like mm -hmm. brand new. And I, and so like, here I am, I'm like, oh, wow. Yep. Like, there, there's my girl. You're talking about my so, girl. Like, well, it take. Oh, sorry, Chris. You stuck. You you paused there for a second. That's okay. I just started talking over you, and I just wanted to make note of yeah. that. I'm sorry. No, my statement's done. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> like so, as soon as you said that, um, I instantly went back to being in fifth grade. And because that is when, like, those are my memories of feeling like the outsider and not understanding why I was always, I always felt like I was on the periphery because I always was on the periphery of social groups. Um, yeah, I mean, instantly. I mean, like, I, I'm having memories of being on my softball team and being in school and just, it's just, it's just amazing, like, you said 10, I was like, Oh yeah, that's, yeah. that's where all yeah. these things are coming up. Yeah. yeah. And it makes sense. And, and to be clear, a lot of girls start mm -hmm. to struggle around fifth grade, right? And middle school is notoriously difficult. And, and there are good reasons for that, right? It's around that age that girl world gets a little bit crazy, <laughs> right? There's, there's a little bit of, you know, or a lot of, you know, cliques and social hierarchy and gossip and all of these things that get much more complex. When you're in second grade, third grade, you make friends based on proximity. Who is in your class at school? Who's in your Girl Scout troop? Who lives on your street? Who, you know, who are, do you have proximity to? But around fifth grade, sixth grade, it really shifts from proximity to having common interests and connecting, having reciprocal interactions. And so that can be particularly hard for autistic girls. And at the same time, that's when the moms are taking themselves out of the equation. They are no longer setting up play dates. So, so mo non-autistic girls can generally start scaffolding for themselves by about fifth grade. If they want a play date, they'll talk to the other girl and work it out and then go ask their moms for, you know, if they need a ride or whatever. But autistic girls may struggle a whole lot when that scaffolding gets taken away. Oh, that, so that is such a, um, that's an interesting piece of just being autistic that you're talking about, like arranging scaffolding those social interactions, because now my girl is older and um, to the age where with a neurotypical girl, mom's not at all involved in, in that social. Um, but yet I, I'm still involved with my girl and helping to, to kind of scaffold. And, and of course, um, because she's bright and energetic and PDA, it's such a like very delicate 
line that I walk, but, but I still have to have some involvement in that. And so I just find that absolutely fascinating in the autistic brain. And you're like, how, how do I, how do I plan something with friends? How, like, how to go about yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. That, that sort of thing tends to be more effortful for autistic people in general than for non-autistic people, right? So that age 10, it, it doesn't surprise me at all to hear that that's when you identify things in your daughter. That's actually pretty typical. And then you can usually look back and see, oh, wait a minute, there were signs, but none of them were sort of big and glaring enough to get our attention. But huh, now that we think of it, she did nothing but read for three years, like for 12 hours a day, you know, maybe reading was an intense interest or, you know, she had periods of selective mutism or, you know, whatever it was, you start looking back now and, and reframing her history a little bit through that lens. Um, so, so I was diagnosed autistic, um, age 35 and, um, it was actually after both of my kids were diagnosed um, because I feel like at, at that point um, I was like, oh, like I got a big old dose of reality. Uh, like, okay, so there's, there's more to autism or more to being autistic than I ever knew. And um, so I had an evaluation and got that diagnosis and it was life changing for me. And, but when you talk about, um, like it's to, I feel like for me, I was in a closet and someone like finally clicked the light on and I was like, oh, here I am. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so, um, it, it was life changing for me and how I could understand myself, but also, it, it has deepened how I understand my kids. But when you're talking about looking back at that history and you're like, oh, that's why that, you know, that's why that was right. that way. That's why I couldn't, I couldn't navigate uh, setting up my own social play dates and, and interactions, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. At an age where other kids could. Right. And I've just heard this from so many late diagnosed autistics, you know, regardless of gender, just it's life changing, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. And it helps the parent child relationship too. your children have a role model. Oh, mom's autistic. She's pretty awesome. I'm like her in lots of ways kind of thing. Right. Yep. So to, to the point of maybe those people who feel like they are autistic but don't quite know how to frame it or they don't know how to go out and seek an evaluation what would your what would your what would you suggest you know or you know how would you suggest people go about what words yeah. should they use so who should they specifically seek Okay. First, I want to clarify when I do speaking engagements <clears throat> um, afterwards, inevitably people come up to me and say, oh my God, I think I might be autistic. Mm -hmm. And I can divide them into two groups. For, for one group, it's people who have just a passing moment of one or two things resonated with me. So I'm going to put myself in that category. Okay. Probably about once a year, I have a moment of like, wait a minute, could I be autistic and I don't know it? Because like I, I have a few sensory sensitivities and my husband tells me I can be rigid sometimes, you know, but, but really the similarities end there. So it lasts for five minutes. And as I start to think through like my social experience and my interests and I don't have any repetitive or systematizing behaviors, as I think through it more globally, I realize no, that doesn't make sense. Just because I have one or two things in common with autistic people doesn't make me autistic, it's passing. So if people have passing thoughts every once in a while that they may be autistic, it may not mean anything at all. That's, it's not uncommon to have passing thoughts. 
But the other group of people who come up to me sometimes after talks or email me, it's rocked their world. Like the more they learn about it, the more mm -hmm. every little piece resonates with them on such a deep level. And they feel like all the little pieces clicking into place and it just moves them to their very soul. And I, I would say if somebody's having that experience and it keeps coming back, then I think they should take it seriously. My experience, and there's some emerging literature about this, is that when somebody, when it resonates that deeply over time, and I'm talking about people who really research it and learn about it and really resonate with it, it tends to be accurate. You know, mm. people tend to figure themselves out, right? Um, and then if they want to, you know, get a formal diagnosis for that validation. It doesn't need to be neuropsych testing. It can be any licensed professional, but you'd have to ask that licensed professional, what's your comfort level with late diagnoses of autism and with diagnosing people who have less obvious autism? Um, because if, if the clinician says, well, I don't do that, you know, I only believe in diagnosing children by age three or whatever, then obviously that's not the right clinician for you. Testing is not necessary. Sometimes it's very helpful if there's lots of complicating factors, um, but it's not necessary. It's mostly done by interviewing um, and history and understanding the person and their story and getting some collateral interviews. I would, there's a myth out there about there being a gold standard test for autism. That is a marketing term. There is no gold standard test for autism, particularly for people who camouflage. That test was not designed for people who camouflage. It was designed for early diagnosis of more stereotypically presenting autism. So for instance, that test is a 45 minute snapshot of behavior. If you know, I finished doing that test and we walk back to the waiting room and in the waiting room, the person engages in really obvious stimming, like flapping their arms. I'm not allowed to count it because the test is over. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be, and I'm not bashing that test that that's called the gold standard test. I use it sometimes in some cases. It's not, I've learned a lot from it. I am not against that test, but it is absolutely not the gold standard. So if you're thinking about going to someone for yourself or your child, I would ask them if they use that test and if so, how and how much they rely on it. Because if that's if, if a clinician believes that's the primary way of identifying autism, they're going to miss. I mean, according to one study, 20 percent of the males and 50 percent of the females. Oh, wow. And that's yes. just one study. Yeah. You know? So I, I think people need to you know, ask these kinds of questions of clinicians before they go. Wow. That, so that's very interesting because that makes me think about, um, you know, maybe an adult or a teen who has sort of learned those masking survival type skills um, yep. that you that yeah they're the ones who are going to not get picked up as their true self in that situation right because it relies more on external behaviors and so many clinicians rely a lot on external behaviors more and more thankfully are realizing no i have to understand the subjective experience and so eye contact is a great example it's not the only example but it's a great example you know, lots of autistic people, you know, come into my office and make typical eye contact. And please notice, I'm not saying good eye contact. That's like a pet peeve of mine. Clinicians call eye contact good or poor. There's no such thing as good or poor eye contact. There's just typical or not typical, right? And we don't need to put value judgments on it, but um, typical eye contact. But then if I ask them, well, what is eye contact like for you? Right. Most non autistic people will say, like, I don't know, I don't really think about it that much. It's fine. But most autistic people, not all, but most will give you some negative experience associated with eye contact. Mm -hmm. They might say, I find it distracting. Eyes creep me out. I can't listen to the conversation if I'm making eye contact. 
people used to complain about it and I worked really hard and now I'm so good at it. Or I have a little trick. I look between the eyes. Like they'll give you something most of the time. And so there's a lot of it. Like as I go through the criteria, the seven criteria, there's a lot of getting at the inner subjective experience. I, I learned early on to look at like the forehead versus the eyes. Yeah. That was less uncomfortable. Yeah. And that's yeah. not something that's common for no. most non-autistic Right. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Plus but, having all those like these mathematical equations going on in my head about, okay, how long do I look? When should I look away? Okay. But you've got to pay attention to what they're saying, but now I have to, have I looked too long? Have I? Yes. <laughs> Right. It's that very it's conscious thought that conscious. Concept, yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Yep. And about gesturing, yep. about volume, about all of these mm -hmm. things. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th thinking about that for me, um, it's funny because since I have been struggling with like specifically eye contact my whole life, I didn't have any idea that it was easier for everybody else. Like right, for right. my perspective was, oh, like, wait, no, like nobody else is thinking all of these thoughts <laughs> about like, how do I look at you? And then like, you know, like how, like what, you know, like what shape do my eye, where am I looking? And, you know, I, I grew up, I had no idea that, everyone wasn't thinking that that's exactly. okay so i've all interjected just this popped in my head like i had read somewhere that if somebody if, if you're like in a romantic relationship and somebody one partner looks at the other per person intently then that meant that you were really into them right so I spent like a week and a half just staring at my husband. <laughs> Finally, he's like, what are you doing? That's creepy. Stop it. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm trying to show you that I love you intently. You know, and he's like, just stop <laughs> because that's, yeah. oh, so yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> This is a bit of a tangent, but one thing you're bringing up is using context to guide your behavior. Mm. And it, it is easier for non-autistic people to very intuitively use context to guide behavior, whereas autistic people can do it, but it's sort of much more effortful for, for them. Yeah. And so Plus that's, it, to it, me, that's an example of like, okay, context and how yeah, much right? excessive eye contact. Right. You're using and then and, it's like, yeah. you know, we, we, we try so hard to apply like these equations to social things, but then there's these unwritten rules that, you know, neurotypical people have that you just, but you've already memorized this equation to do the eye contact thing, but then right. it's not right, you know? So yeah. It, Right, because it's all context dependent. Yes. So like how close do you stand to somebody? It right. depends, right? And how much eye contact do you make? It depends. And how much talking should you do? It depends. And how personal should you get? It depends. Like everything about social interactions is so context dependent and it changes minute to minute. Yeah. So like if I'm walking down the hallway with a colleague, we're going to keep so much space in between us. And then if we walk into a crowded elevator, will stand much closer together. That's intuitive because the context dictates it. And then when you leave the elevator, you separate again. That's intuitive also. So it's just a tiny little example of the like million and one ways that non-autistic people use context without even thinking about right. it to right. guide us. Yep. And that's why you can't just like teach somebody, here's the social skills. Right. Right. You can't just listen to somebody say, <laughs> if you look at the person who you're in love right. with, they'll know that you're in love with them. Right. Because apparently it creeps them out. I, I, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. That happened to my son once. And my son is like, seriously, the sweetest, calmest, like he could be playing a video game and I could say, honey, can you stop that and go like empty the dishwasher? He'll say, sure. No problem. Like he is, has the easiest, sweetest temperament no behavioral problems, no pushback, no violence his whole life. And one day he punched 
a dear friend in the face for no reason at all. It was so unbelievably out of character for him. And they, they had known each other forever. They weren't having an argument or anything. And so when I asked him later, it's like, walk me through what was going on in your mind. He said, and they were maybe 17 at the time. He said, I saw him take off his glasses. And I remember in the movies, somebody takes off their glasses before they're having a fight. And I didn't know why we were going to have a fight, but I thought that's what was happening. Oh, it was his right? heart. Right? I mean, he, he felt heart. terrible, of course, but it that's context, right? Yeah. 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 And it's so my son is a PDA and he we do have we've have history of maybe having some violent tendencies and all those. Other. We are so much further down the road and much better place now, but I can so see him rationalizing it that way and just seeing it that way. Like, right. well, this because is what you're this looking means. at a detail yes. and not thinking about the bigger picture, yep. which is harder for many yes. autistic people yeah. to do. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, we've been talking a lot about the social piece of autism, but then there's this whole other piece, which is the repetitive and restricted behaviors that are also very misunderstood. So for example, like in uh, special interests, a lot of people associate autism with having atypical interests, like, you know, orange traffic cones or airport codes or train schedules or whatever. Um, my, my, my daughter right now is into international travel warnings. Like she's totally into international travel warnings. It fascinates her. So atypical interests, but with many people who have less obvious autism and particularly many people assigned female at birth, birth um, it's typical interests that get really intense. So very typical interests. So some of the most common ones are animals, either animals in general or particular animal, plants, um, makeup actually comes up quite a lot, um, reading, reading comes up a lot. And I don't mean like reading for three hours a day. I mean, literally reading for 12 hours a day and getting in trouble for it. Yeah. You're both busting to say something. We, we, <laughs> go ahead, Krista. You're up. Um, the, so Heather, <laughs> Heather and I are both just laughing because, um, that, that was one of the big things in my life is, um, my special interests, like my entire life growing up, were not atypical. They yeah. they didn't seem um, abnormal or like it was exactly what you would expect um, uh, of a girl. And um, but then like n nobody was really like seeing the depth of that interest. So, um, one for me was Barbies. Yeah. Um, very, very like, Oh, all girls love Barbies, you know, in the mid nineties, um, makeup is, um, was huge. Um, and then also, uh, reading, and, and so those are, and those are all still like very intense special interests, um, for me. And, but if I just was like, I love to read, I think Barbie's super fun and I love makeup. You so Carissa, like let me ask you what makes them intense because I can hear a lot of parents thinking, well, but like, so if my kid likes makeup, they're autistic. And obviously that's not what we're saying. So can you describe the inner experience, like the intensity of it? Um, yeah. And, and so that is the key. So for me, if we're, let's just talk about makeup. When I am looking at makeup, if I'm buying makeup, if I'm putting on makeup, it's like, um, it's like so deeply satisfying. It, it's like, it sets my soul on fire, right? Hmm. I, I love it. It's so interesting. I can, 
uh, engage with it for like so long. And, and it's like this calm, peace, serenity in doing it. And so like putting my makeup on in the morning, it's not like I'm putting on some stuff and heading out the door. So I look decent. It, it's like artwork that I am creating. Um, and so also within that, um, it's a collection. And yeah. so I love specifically eyeshadow palettes. So um, I don't even know what like a neurotypical woman would maybe have as far as like how many eyeshadow palettes do you have in your bathroom, um, right? I don't, I have no idea. I, have I zero. probably, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I like, I probably have maybe like, I don't know, 30 to 50 wow. eyeshadow palettes in the bathroom. Wow. Like I have them and there's, and they're of course like all stacked I don't have by that many. shape and size, right? And so I have a whole right. jar on my desk uh, and I have about eight different lip color, lipstick, lip glosses, but, and, but I also have another stash of my lips, you know, my lip stuff in the yeah, bathroom. And I can right? see your face like yeah. lighting up as you talk about, it. you're getting so excited. And like, so I'm going to use myself as your comparison group as a non-autistic person. Um, I, I like makeup. I like the fact that it makes me look a little bit better. I see it as a necessary evil. Putting it on in the morning is like the most boring two minutes of my day. I literally play a song and tell myself, Donna, just do it for one song and get through it because it's so boring. But I do it like kind of like you said, because I just need to get it on my face so I can get out the door. It doesn't give me any deep sense of pleasure, although I like the fact that I look better. And sometimes when I buy makeup, it's slightly, oh, so slightly fun to get something new, but it's very slight. So you can see, I'm glad that we got into this so people can really hear the difference. And you also brought something else into this. So a different um, criterion under the repetitive and restricted category, separate from interests, is behavior that is repetitive or systematizing and you systematizing your 30 to 50 eye color palettes, <laughs> right? That they're not just like thrown in a drawer somewhere, but that there's a system to them. Would I, would I base a diagnosis of autism on that alone? Of course not. But is that interesting information? It is because people think that the, this new criterion we're talking about, new to this conversation, not to the DSM, of repetitive behavior, so informally called stimming, they think it's just flapping. It's mm -hmm. things like arm flapping. Mm -hmm. And it's so much more than that. And one aspect of that that people don't think about is systematizing objects or information. So list making. I've had so many clients when I say, tell me about your lists or spreadsheets and their face light up and they pull out notebooks, especially if we're on Zoom and they're at home. And they just have page after page after page after page of like lists of dog names categorized by male versus female dogs. Or, oh, are you getting a dog? No, I just really liked thinking about dog names and wanted to categorize them. That kind of thing. Uh oh, is Heather showing me a list? You're getting I'm a showing thing. you a <laughs> list notebook that was gifted to me by Carissa. Uh -huh. And you'll notice it's blank. Uh huh. Because yes. I have ADHD and I can't make lists. Yeah. So, but I just wanted to show you that this was a gift from Carissa because she is a list maker. Yeah. And I have it, I keep it on my desk so that I can. Like, make sure my, I love you, Chris, and I appreciate, I deeply, I, I love that when I look at it, I think of you, but I also test my pins on it to see if they are writing. <laughs> so, yes, she's, I'm mean, like every, you're, 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 I'm just, I could make a list of all the characteristics that you are mentioning that Carissa has yeah. yes. on the list of the notepad list that Chris, right. it gave me to make lists. And so often, like for something like list making, parents may be unaware 
that their daughter has all these lists or Excel spreadsheets, or if they're aware of it, it they don't associate it with autism. Right. Right. And, uh, and to be clear, we're not talking about typical to-do lists here. We're right. talking about just sort of yep. this unusual level of categorizing planning. I've had kids tell me they plan trips in astounding mm -hmm. levels of detail. They're not taking these trips. They don't even feel a need to take it. It's the planning part mm -hmm. that gives them this deep, deep, deep joy. So it's, it's things like that, that so many people aren't aware of that are signals that, oh, hey, you might be autistic. And I stay away from lists because I will put a bunch of time into them and then lose them and not have any <laughs> idea where they are. And so I just fly by yeah. the seat of my pants. It's yeah. just what I do. It's I, the charm of the ADHD. That's right. <laughs> I call it a gift. My husband, not quite on board with the gift part, but hey, I'm a lot of fun. I, I can remember in... Um, filling out so many parent surveys um, from my kids when we were like, what is, you know, what's happening with them? And, and me being like, I need to know more. And I can remember the question about repetitive behaviors. And I had never heard that before. And I can remember like going to the people in the clinic where, you know, there were gathering the info and I was like, but I don't know what this part means. So I can't give you the information and, and trying to get, um, an actual description of that was hard for them to even give to me. And it was like, if you rock back and forth, if you flap right. your hands and then you spin right. in circles and I can remember being like, Oh, but neither of my kids do that. And it wasn't until I started looking into, like, I had to go home and like Google it and research it and to even find out that piece. And, and those are professionals who didn't even know quite how to explain it. So that's, and that is part. why we wrote. That's why we wrote the book, the, the, the first book for sure, is just to help people understand all these, all the, I mean, we're barely touching mm -hmm. the tip of the iceberg today. There's so many aspects of each of the criteria. And I'll give you one more really quick one. I know we need to wrap up, but sensory is one of them. And people think of sensory sensitivities in the five sensory systems that everybody knows about, right? Touching, smelling, tasting, seeing, hearing, but there are three other sensory systems that people don't think about and need to. One of them is proprioception. Mm -hmm. and that has to do with your, your body parts, like your hands and feet and arms and legs. And where are they and what are they doing? And if you have low proprioception, you might be clumsy and drop things or knock things over. But I find, and I haven't seen this in the research, but I find that a lot of PDAs are proprioception seeking. And they're just like constantly like touch, 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 touch. I just need constant input to my hands mostly. Um, and non-PDA or autistic kids can have that too. And another one is interoception, which is knowing what's going on inside your body, like mostly your organs. So am I hungry? Am mm -hmm. I thirsty? Do I have to pee? Am I anxious? Am I angry? right? Knowing their feelings and knowing their homeostatic emotions. So, so many of these kids, parents tell us, oh my God, she wouldn't eat all day long if I didn't stick food in front of her. And when I stick food in front of her, she eats it because she was hungry. She didn't know she was hungry. That's a real difference that a lot of people aren't aware of that is part of all of this. Yeah. So that, that right there, that's why we wrote the book to help mm -hmm. people understand the scope of all of these criteria. Oh my goodness, so much incredible information today. Um, I just love when we get to to talk with people, new people, and I get to go away feeling like, man, I learned so much. And I, I just can't thank you enough for sharing all of this great information with us and not only just teaching me and Heather, but being able to you know, help us teach everybody else. So thank you so much for chatting with us today.
Yep. Well, and it's thank an, you for inviting me. It's so delightful to meet you both. Sorry. Likewise. Heather. No, no, no worries. And if you are a parent out there and you're wondering if um, the book is this autism, a guide for clinicians and everyone else, and you're thinking maybe it's going to be too textbooky, too clinical, too this, too that, it's not. It, I promise you, it's not. It's. I'm not going to say it's a easy read, but it, it you can. I, I think a lay person can can definitely pick this up and and really gain a lot of valuable information from it. So thank you so much for putting this out into the world and shining a little bit more sunlight on this really complex topic. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And for anyone who would like more information about uh, pathological semantic avoidance, um, you can visit our website at journeyswithpda.com. And we will also have all of Donna's wonderful information um, in the description so that you can learn more about her. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.